This is a basic wrap workflow demonstration. So to start out, I'm going to go ahead and open up a file that I already have scanned. But for the scanning uh, control, if you need to capture uh, data, that you can come over to the capture tab here and this is where you can capture information and if you need to hit scan whatever plugin you have installed it will connect to that device and scan now to set the device that um, it will use to capture you can go to the application button digitizers and set it here so you can set whatever hard probe device or whatever scanning devices you want and you have to install those separately um, so once you have uh, data captured, um, you can see here that I have the data and I'm rotating it by clicking my center mouse wheel. Um, these are point clouds. So you can see over here on the left hand side, I have a folder with some scans that are already, al already aligned to each other. And then you also see that I have some individuals, oops, accidentally uh, moved that one scan into the folder. Um, so if I just grab this guy, it'll, I actually can click on a data set and see which one is which by holding shift control. So I'm making that mistake just gives you me an opportunity to kind of show something. So if I hit shift control and click on scans, it'll take me directly to the scan and then I can do whatever I want with it. So in this instance, if I hold shift and control, click on that, you'll see that the that f scan data for and I'll just drag it out of the folder. That was something I was going to show anyway because it, this makes editing super fast if I can just hold that and click on it and then there's another shortcut F2 will show only that object so you can work with it. This works really well for like large groups of scans so if I'm looking at a data set and I see something like right here and maybe it's difficult to edit without hurting other scans if I just hit shift control F2 and then if I want to window in and delete something and you see when I window in and delete if I click in space it doesn't clear the selection um, so if I need to clear the selection I can right click and say clear all now if I click on F2 it'll take me back and again the F um, click on the group it'll take me back to that now F2 is probably one of the most powerful shortcuts I recommend everybody use that and because um, that will do the show only functionality. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, this is a point cloud, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it right out of the gate. If I show only this scan and zoom in, you'll notice that it looks like there are these little cells here. If I come over to the display tab and I turn on points, you'll see that they are actually points. We call them ordered points in our software. Um, because we collect them along a uniform grid and we know their neighbors so like each point kind of has an address and we know um, again their relationship to the points around them and the reason why we scan this way um, we also can scan in raw data as well but scanning with ordered data significantly speeds up the process so if I just um, just to show you how fast these things. If I just say that I want to wrap those points into a polygon, you see it's literally like an instant, instantaneous thing. So the conversion process is significantly fast. So um, that's why we do order data. Um, there's very, very little um, error added by using them. Uh, very little bit of, of smoothing that goes into creating them. Um, so that is a huge benefit. So the wrap product scans as ordered data or raw data. It doesn't scan in polygon data um, as uh, DX does. But as you can see, what I like to say is ordered data is almost halfway to becoming a polygon because, again, the points know their address or their relationship to each other. All right, so the first thing you see is I need to align these two pieces as well as uh, merge them together into a polygon. 
Um, so the first step is to come over to the alignment section and do a manual registration. This is uh, what we call it inside of this particular software. Um, we do alignments for moving things to coordinate systems. We do registrations in here when we're actually taking scans and aligning them together, right? So we kind of divide up um, this into two areas, a scan registration, again, aligning scans to each other, and then alignments are aligning the whole object to the world coordinate system. So we'll get to that in a minute. So if I need to do a manual alignment, um, the way this works is it works with groups as well. Um, <clears throat> you can see on the left hand side, uh, I'm going to use group one as my fixed object, and then I'm going to use the data four as my floating object. And there are two different types of alignment. One is called single point registration. Single point is you uh, align the two objects so they are facing the same direction. Like you visually align them in the graphics window and you click a single point and it uses their rotation and translation and then that single point to align them together. It works very well, but I will say my default is endpoint just because it's a little bit more consistent and I I don't really have to spend much more time clicking my three individual points. Um, so if I want to do that, what I do is I, I align them together in a, in a similar direction. Then I click the common points between the two. And you can see I'm just getting close it doesn't have to be exact because when I hit next, I'm going to hit next in a second, it will actually move that data here and it does a lightweight best fit. What I like to do is not add it to the group folder. I actually turn this off by default. So when I move it up, it actually will move it into this data area, but it keeps it separate um, from that other folder. And what that does for me helps give me an undo so like if that wasn't my favorite registration doesn't work right um, it's still not part of the folder and it gives me like a verification stage um, just to make sure that it does align pro properly before I throw it in the folder so I'm going to select these three points and you'll see it align there and again once you turn that off it should remember it from there on out um, so now all the data is up here and it looks like it's pretty closely aligned and I accept it. So visually it looks like it's aligned pretty well. So the next stage is to actually, I click on each individual scan and just see is it close. Now if they are, then I will go ahead and drag them manually into the group. Now once they're in the group, I will run a global registration and hit apply. And now because I'm running it on the entire group, it will shuffle all the individual scans and create a best possible alignment between all the data sets. And as you see this, this color pattern that we see where the individual scans are different colors and they're bisecting each other over and over again, that's a very good sign because it means that the data is highly accurate and the overlap is highly accurate. So if I look over here, 0 0.02 is the average distance. Standard deviation is 0 0.028. Um, and then it will also give you a pair of maximum deviations. So data set 1 and 13 are the the extents, the highest and lowest, or the, the two furthest out from each other. Even though this is a highly accurate scan, it's just telling you these two are the worst of the group, even though it's still highly accurate. So I will accept that and you can see it looks very good. At this stage, you know, I will do cropping. In this instance, the data looks very good, but you know, I'll remove um, outliers and things manually if I have to um, before I go ahead and merge. Um, so now that it's time to merge, I'll come over to the points tab. Wrap will actually take each individual point cloud and make it its own polygon piece. Um, so we don't want to run that in this instance because our goal here is to create one polygon object, not 
uh, 14 individual polygon objects. So what we're going to do is do a merge instead. Combine point objects will make them all one point object. Merge will make them all one polygon object. And then wrap will make them all individual uh, polygons. And then convert to unordered points will kind of strip off the intelligence that's built into those ordered point clouds where they don't know their neighbors. Um, so we're going to come back over to merge and run this. Now the merge tool actually uh, is doing um, probably three or four different major things here and I like to always talk about this. The first step here, this is kind of a progression of what it's doing. Um, the first step is it's doing local noise reduction so it does a noise reduction on each individual cloud. You can turn that off if you want to. I generally leave it at medium. It's not super aggressive. Um, so it does a local noise reduction on each individual point cloud. Then it does another final global registration, which is that best fit of the clouds. You can turn that off as well if you already did it and you don't want it to run again. I tend to just leave it on. It can't hurt to run it one more time. Now global noise reduction will actually reduce the noise between the clouds, the overlapping areas. It will reduce the thickness of data. I have it set for auto here. It, that works fine for presentations and stuff, but you can move it down to data uh, medium as well, or even turn it off if you have better luck with it. Keep original data. That's just going to keep my original scans. I like to keep that on. Delete small components. If it's got little bits and pieces floating out in space, it'll delete them. Then the sampling, um, I keep it on high quality. And then, you know, I'm operating on sample data set most of the time. So I actually set my max triangles to 1 million triangles. Um, if you're working on a highly detailed object, you might, might want to raise that to two, three, five million triangles for a high end. We can go way higher than that, but many times that's not necessary. So uh, one million tends to be a good baseline um, that's very easy for the computer to work with. So that part is actually decimating. It's merging it all and doing the global alignment, but then it does a decimation at the end. So I get a target sized polygon and I know how big it is when it creates it. Remove overlap will take all that redundant data and reduce it. Optimize for sparse data. I kind of leave these both on optimize for sparse data, optimize for evenly spaced data. Um, so sparse data is if you have a few points here, a few points here, and they're kind of far apart. It's just telling the algorithm that it's it's okay to connect more of those together. And then evenly spaced data, which is what this is, um, it's telling it that the data is pretty evenly set um, spaced so you don't need to jump across larger, slightly larger distances. Maximum number of edges for a hole. So if a hole has 25 triangle edges around it or less, that it will automatically fill it. That's the default. It works pretty well. You can adjust it up or down if you want to, but you'll notice it will still preserve some of these holes here. If you have a high resolution mesh, 25 really isn't that many. So I'll, I will hit OK and let the software calculate the merged mesh. You'll see down below this is kind of an estimation based on the routines that it's running. By no means is it accurate like most computers but you'll see that it takes all those objects together and converts them into one polygon. So just like before, the F2 command works like um, other, like it does with other objects. And then now comes the 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 side where we will like cr clean up the mesh and do some basic mesh editing. Um, if I need to see the edges of the triangles, I come over to the display tab, turn on the edges, and you can see that. So it's pretty high resolution considering it's only a million triangles. Now if I need to do some hole filling, I'll come over and do a fill single here. If I just click on a boundary, I tend to use curvature or tangent as my default. Tangent is slightly more consistent for me. And then I have it set for fill complete boundary right now. So for some of these, I you know I wouldn't normally just manually fill these, but.
but just for presentation purposes you can see that I can select these areas and fill them and it does a great job even filling things like this and something like this area the whole filling tool is, is very robust you can not only do uh, tangent fill curvature or flat fill I'm going to toggle over to flat you have the ability to do what's called a fill partial or a bridge so I'm just going to use this this area to show both normally I might, I might do a partial all the way across here but I'll do a partial from here you select a point and then you select another point then you select which side you want to fill and then hit OK so you can see here that it it filled that side now a bridge you actually click and drag and click and drag to dictate how you want it to fill and then I'll just toggle back over to complete if I need to and then I'm going to toggle over to tangent for the rest of this and it does an alright job you know in this instance I would actually scan more of that area um, that would be the most ideal but if I don't have the ability to do that you know it does a decent job um, for like a spike that's sticking out there are some interesting tools here that you can use if I come over to my selection tools on the right hand side if I select the lasso tool and then you'll see I make sure it's select visible I can kinda of go around that area I can come over and hit D feature and you'll see that it'll remove that area for me so if I just window in and hit D feature and if I'm not happy with how those triangles are very sharp I can do that too you know if I don't like those sharp triangles I can window those in window those in and do the D feature now for areas like this I can go around that and delete the triangles by just like windowing in and hitting delete um, or I can use this select custom region tool so what this does is it clicks individual vertices on the triangle mesh and then you'll see how it's got a very weird uh, white line that goes in between so it's following the triangle edges to get to the next point and then when I right click it'll accept now I can always add more to the selection just by windowing in if I need to now I can hit delete and then do a flat hole fill or I could just hit D feature in this instance and D feature does a great job of removing that area for me now for these holes I can kinda of do something along those lines as well except for I can just go ahead and say select through and just kind of remove these like if I don't want these holes there I could just do a uh, through on all of these and something like this like if I wanted to do that same select through I can always do this too where I select all this bottom area and I say that I want to add to a selection and you'll see it makes a selection set over here I can say show only that selection and then I can just work with this piece without worrying about things in the background this is not necessary like I can edit that another way but the uh, you know I just use it to show a piece of functionality is super valuable when you're doing heavy um, scan data editing so it's just a very powerful tool for other scenarios where it may be the only way to fix something which I've had that happen many times where it's the only way to repair a mesh you know and if I have areas where it's still kinda bumpy again I can just kinda window in D feature it's just super fast to do it that way D feature is basically just doing a delete hole fill with a little bit of cleanup triangles on the end on the edges um, but it just does it very fast for you so now once I'm done editing just that area I can click back on the main mesh click right back on the triangle mesh and say view entire model again now if I want to just go ahead and fill all the rest of the triangles I can come over to fill all 
and just tell it go ahead and fill all with tangent you know and you can select which one you want to to use if you hit apply you'll notice how fast it does it it's I don't know how it does it that fast but it, it fills all the rest of the holes usually within you know less than a minute even on super heavy models now if I want to break some of those sharp edges on here I can run remove spikes and hit apply and what that does is kind of knocks off the sharp edges it knocks off the sharp edges like the high peak triangles maybe there's just a couple sticking up you can think of it as like a sandpaper running across the surface it's it's removing the the mountain tops the the tips or the high pieces um <clears throat> so you know you can run that if it's if your goal is to go ahead and fit surfaces on this later um you would want to run that uh, because it creates a nice smooth surface it makes it so the the auto surfacer or manual surfaces don't have to work as hard to try to capture those sharp edges and textures and stuff you know so it it helps to to do that in certain instances it all just depends on you know what your deliverable is you know so here i just saw that there was like a little point um, let me reverse it, I guess. But I saw that there's like a little kind of a dent area right there. So if I want to just remove that by selecting it. Now from here, um, you know, if I wanted to decimate this down to a certain size, you know, you can run decimate. I'll just reduce it a little bit so we can um, just demonstrate the tool. So if I just say I want it to be 500,000 and then click outside of the box it'll tell me what the reduction ratio is and then if I want to give it a curvature priority so what it's going to do is it's going to reduce more in the large flat areas and less in the high curvature areas and then hit apply and you'll see down here the triangle count is on screen all the time so it shows you how many triangles are in space and it gives you a bounding box as well that helps you kind of Make sure that your units are correct and the size and scale of this object is what you intend it to be. So you can see here it decimated it down to 500,000 triangles. And again, if I click over to the display tab and turn on the edges, it's still pretty high resolution even though it's hot, uh, half a million. So I, I spend a lot of time trying to convince people that they don't need like uh, a trillion points to describe a shape just because our scanners have that ability to capture just millions upon millions sometimes this is more effective and if I compare this back to the original mesh you'll notice that I really I only modified it a little bit um, in the grand scheme of things so <clears throat> so I redu reduced it down using the uh, decimate tool there's some other tools in here that are really handy the mesh doctor I always make sure I run this after I get done editing anything um, you can see here that it, it found a few different categories. These are different categories of errors that we find in meshes. And it does highlight them. So you can see here there are some spikes and things. Now if I want to see, there, there are three instances of errors. If I want to cycle through them, you'll see that some of them are hidden. So if I turn on the clipping plane, it'll show like down in this groove is where that area is. Right. Now I can tell it to go ahead and fix it, or I can just remove these areas because it's really not that accurate having uh, that data down in there. So what I would do with this type of data is come around it with this guy here. And if we cause any sort of chatter here, we can fix that. <clears throat> now, if I go back to Mesh Doctor, you'll see that it found one little area.
usually it doesn't zoom out that far if I show it to you. Um, if I ever have an issue like that, what I'll do is I'll just tell it to delete it. So it'll just go ahead and delete that data. Now if I get out of this and I go to the whole fill, I have a similar tool where, which will come through. Oh, so it looks like I might have had a, a floating piece somewhere. I deleted that data, which should have caused the hole, right? So maybe that's what it was if I come in too much doctor and run it again. I got nothing. So I probably had a floating component out in the middle of nowhere that was causing it. <clears throat> now, there are a ton of other different tools in here uh, as far as removing spikes and relaxing and smoothing things. Um, but for the sake of today, you'll see that I created a pretty good mesh. Now I want to align this to the world. You can see if I make sure my world axis and my display tab is is handy. Um, you know, I can hit this this uh, axis down here and it will take me. You can see it's a little ways away. Um, what I can do is go ahead and fit some planes and uh, feature geometry and use those for alignment. Um, so what I'm going to do is use this bottom block um, to align it and then I'm going to also use this axis just to kind of show uh, you know how I would do this. So I'm going to use the bottom plane. And I'll, you know I can create all kinds of construction features from the features tab and then if I create a selection I like to use this crease angle tool. This right here will select large flat areas and if I right click I can say I want to fit a plane feature. Hit apply, hit next. Okay so I can best fit a plane to that area. And then if I want to do that same thing here, you'll notice that if I click on it, it'll go all the way around um, because this is just for that crease angle tool. It selects, um, it selects that angle. So there is another tool here where I can say crease angle selection tool where I click and I drag up and it will just kind of like flood that area up to certain angles. So I can say I want to best fit a plane there. And I could stay in this dialog and do another one. And you see what I did? I actually didn't hit next. So I'm just going to go ahead and clear my selection and do this one again. Hit apply. And what I didn't do is I didn't hit next. I, I went over there and clicked. I think I just went a little bit too fast. Hit apply, hit next. So now you see I have best fit two planes on each side. Now if I want to come over, I can say I want to create an average plane between this guy and that guy. I'm going to hit apply. And then I'm going to use that same crease angle select tool for that cylinder. And I am going to just go ahead and fit a cylinder to it. I don't have to. I can create an axis as well, but cylinder does the same same thing. You can actually say fit a line to a cylinder or cone rotational axis, all three of those. But for what we're doing, um, that's good, to, good enough. <clears throat> all right, so now I want to align this to the world coordinate system. If I come over to alignment and align to world. Now, first, this seems really confusing how this is laid out. But it's not too bad once you kind of get an idea, a couple of concepts under your belt. What it's asking you is this is like what's in the world coordinate system that you, you're allowed to use to snap to. So the XY plane, XZ plane, and then just the X axis, Y axis, Z axis, and the origin. So by default, it's kind of like pre selecting the XY and this plane, which I'm actually fine with that. Um, and down below is the result. So what you're telling it is to go ahead and slap this plane onto that one. So if I say create pair, it will go ahead and make those two match. It'll move it so they match each other. And then what I like to do is I like to take that, that cylinder axis there and I want to like snap it to a, a specific axis. 
Uh, another thing is look at the, the Z is flip-flopped. So if I want to go ahead and flip Z the other direction. So now if I zoom in and see here, see my coordinate system where Z is up. That's the way I want it to be in this instance. So now that I know that, you see that Y is in this direction. If I just say that I want the Y axis and the cylinder axis to be locked to each other, you'll see that it, it will go ahead and lock those to each other. Now, you see, all it does is spin around that plane because the plane is constrained still. So it's just going to spin around until it hits that. And then my final axis is the XZ. See the XZ plane? I want the XZ plane to match up with this, the uh, plane 4. So if I hit create pair there, it locks those in. Now if I want to preview what's going on, I can just hide all the features at once by clicking toggle all features off and just zoom in and look. That's how I want my coordinate system. I want the the uh, cylinder constrained to the to the y-axis and you'll see the uh, xy to that original plane so this is where I want it to be then when I hit OK it moves it to the origin <clears throat> now you can create all kinds of constructed geometry inside of the features so that is the secret sauce of trying to use all the features to create something that fully constrains the part and locks it into a coordinate system or an alignment. Then once you create that geometry you come over to the alignment tool align to world and it will lock it in. So that's how you do that. That's the alignment process. Um, now from here is the surfacing. Some people want to do this. I'll just show auto surface for this presentation. Um, but you know, if you're ready to save this out as a STL, a PLY, OBJ, any of the mesh formats, you can just right click on it and say save. You can save the whole document this way as well, but you know, if I want to save a binary STL, I just select that and hit save and it'll write it out. Uh, so if that's your uh, point where you want to just export, you can do that. Or if you need this to be a CAD file, to go over via st um, step file, I just file something like that. We need to go ahead and put surfaces on it. So if I come over to the exact surfaces tab and I hit exact surfacing, there are two methods. One of them is the auto surface button here, or the manual surfacing workflow. Auto surface is the easy button technique where it's going to automatically just fit surfaces to the geometry here based on curvature and it'll automatically try to figure out how to best fit NURB surfaces to it. Um, and then the manual workflow is we have all these assisted tools to help you extract the contours, the patches, the grids, and then fit surfaces um, so you can manually walk through that process. Today we're just going to do the auto surfacing just for the sake of time. Um, but if I just come over to auto surface, the main thing you need to adjust in here is mechanical or organic. It's going to take two different approaches um, to surfacing the part. This is more of a mechanical part, obviously. Uh, organic is many times like a person's anatomy or something like that. Um, but the organic one has more freedom. So if mechanical doesn't work on your mechanical part, you can toggle over to organic and it should be able to complete it. I have interactive mode turned on right now, so if it does run into a problem, it will stop and ask me to help. Um, if you turn that off, it'll just go ahead and try to solve the problems on its own and create surfaces. But the interactive mode is nice because it just kind of warns you if there's an area that it's having a problem with and it'll allow you to try to fix it in process. So right now, for the mechanical workflow, it's nine steps. It's already st phase five of nine. Um, and then you'll see it down here on the, at the bottom. And really what it's doing is, is it's almost like this 
virtual upholstery is the way I like to describe it, where it's taking these square patches and wrapping them around the surface of the part. And the goal here is to take a mesh model, a triangle model, and convert it over to something that can get inside of CAD. Yes, this isn't the most beautiful CAD object, but if you're working with something and you just need a representation of it over inside of CAD, many times this works just fine. Um, another reason why these are acceptable is maybe, again, it's somebody's anatomy is a highly organic shape that would take just months to reverse engineer. This can help you get something over into CAD to work off of. As I mentioned before, it's telling me that it has some poor patch angles, which is pretty common, and those aren't devastating to the surfacing process. Um, so if you just say, yes, I want to work with them manually, I use the same little wizard technique. You see, that's actually not really even a, a major issue there. And you just drag the little endpoint, the node, and remove the angle problem. So it's just saying that there's a possibility that it will create a wrinkle in the surface if you leave it at that sharp angle. When I'm done, I hit the done button, not the OK button. And it will go ahead and finish out the process of fitting the CAD surfaces. So now you'll see it's on stage nine of nine, or phase nine of nine, where it's actually fitting the NURBS patches. When it's done, it turns like a pewter looking color. You'll see that here. Again, if we accept that command and we come over and turn on the patch boundaries, exactly what we saw when we previewed it. This is the CAD object that it's going to spit out. If I want to save this out, I just come over to save and then you'll see I can save it as step VDA um, parasolid. I just bring it over to whatever my favorite flavor of CAD package is. Um, and if I do need to just check deviation from the mesh, I can actually come over here and say deviation and for some reason it's telling me I couldn't compute that tolerance. Oh, I had it selected for a point cloud. I need to just say that I want to com compare the mesh with the uh, CAD surface. And remember those point clouds are actually in a different location. So if I tell it the actual mesh that I want to use, then it will do the comparison here. And you can see here if I just change it to 0.1 and then 0 0.02, which is highly accurate, 0 0.02 millimeters. <clears throat> You'll see here in high curvature areas, we soften some of that data with the surfaces. High curvature areas are usually what you'll have an issue with because, and you know, that's because it's the auto tool. That's usually acceptable, right, to be between 0.1 and some high curvature areas and a 0.02 for most of the part. So you do have a deviation analysis tool. Um, so that uh, wraps up the basic wrap workflow. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to comment on the video. Thank you.